It appears that internet streaming services are winning their war against TV broadcasting. As time's gone by, having a TV channel with a schedule and allotted time slots for programming has started to make less sense when compared with the convenience of being able to open Netflix or Prime and watch a new episode of a TV series at any time of your choosing. And with the onset of the global pandemic, it seems that streaming services are starting to win the simultaneous war that they were starting to wage with cinema. Internet TV shows are more convenient than regular broadcasting because they remove the effort that the viewer has to put in to be sat at their TV at a specific time. And internet released movies are even more convenient because the viewer doesn't have to make time in their week to actually physically go to a cinema. And if the cinema becomes a dangerous place, then that makes internet released movies make even more sense. But releasing movies to streaming services was starting to make sense prior to the pandemic as well, and there were multiple reasons for this. Since so many movies are niche, studios would be concerned that conventional mainstream distribution would lead to huge losses, because if someone's just made the effort of travelling to the cinema and has the choice between a groundbreaking, difficult, challenging potential Oscar nomination, or something fun that they can eat popcorn to, 9 times out of 10, people are going to choose the popcorn movie. And the challenging movie is not going to make its money back. And given the internet for one thing removes the cost of cinema distribution, and for another removes the barrier of effort on the part of the viewer, people are actually more likely to take chances with niche movies that probably wouldn't have made their money back if they were released via conventional channels. As a financial model, releasing new movies on the internet makes a lot of sense for independent productions and for big studios as well. This leads to cases like Annihilation, which gets released in cinemas in America but ends up with the Netflix original logo slapped on it in the rest of the world. Netflix movies have become a big deal in recent years, cemented in 2019 of course by Martin Scorsese's The Irishman, which added a degree of prestige to the Netflix original movie moniker. They also had the unfinished Orson Welles movie. Netflix clearly want their line of original movies to have the same high regard that their original series have, because as a distribution model it works incredibly well. It's cheaper, more convenient for the viewer, and niche movies that would fail at the box office but end up becoming cult hits actually have the opportunity to find an audience upon release. However, before the pandemic made watching new movies in cinemas virtually impossible, in spite of the small cluster of critical darlings, Netflix's original movie line was having a serious respectability issue. They kept releasing movie after movie under the Netflix original brand that would either barely scrape above passable or would actively set new record in critical and or audience scorn, and it is still very much a problem. They were releasing so many bad movies one after another that you were left thinking that anything decent they happened to release was a complete accident. Prior to the pandemic, the few critical darlings that Netflix released were still having to work overtime to shed their movie line's negative image. So what I thought might be fun is if I watch five bad movies under the Netflix original movie banner and pretend to examine why they're such massive failures as movies and why they're really not helping shed the Netflix original movie's negative image. When I say pretend, I obviously mean I'm using this format as a vehicle for sitting back and taking the piss. Ha! Made you think this was going to be a serious, thoughtful analysis piece, but it's actually just a piss take. So let's start with the most recent addition to Netflix's growing list of movies that gained a rare 0% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes. The Last Days of American Crime, a film so hideously long and boring that it's the only piece of Netflix content where the Are You Still Watching prompt comes up before the thing's even finished. The Last Days of American Crime is basically the purge but backwards. Instead of having one night where all crime is legal, in a not too distant future, the US government comes up with a signal that messes with your brain that makes it impossible for people to commit crime at all. Now, as an idea, this is stupid, yes, but there's potentially thousands and thousands of ways for it to play out, and about a million different implications. Personally, what I would do is emphasise the government-sanctioned mind control element and set it in an ultra-conservative utopian suburb where a man wakes up one day and finds the mind control stopped working, and he has the sudden urge to kill all of his insufferable neighbours, and in his delirium, he goes to switch off the signal and unleash hell on Earth. But The Last Days of American Crime chooses to take this dumb, overblown, but admittedly interesting soft sci-fi premise and basically just makes a criminal shoot at each other bang bang movie because it can't be asked doing anything creative. Anyway, because the theme of this movie appears to be complete incompetence, the way they set up its dumb, crime-blocking signal premise is they have one of their characters just dump all of the exposition into voiceovers over the course of the opening. The government had been working on the API signal in secret labs for years. Now they decided it was time to start testing on the real world. The government was learning, tuning their little box of horrors. 
hey, I've got an idea. How about instead of this, we have like, say, a scene where a government scientist character demonstrates the machine that produces this crime blocking signal to a bunch of investors? I mean, it would be basic spoon feeding, sure, but it'd be better than this, surely. Anyway, the whole thing's a meandering mess. It's two and a half hours long, feels like it's double that, and the first hour and a half of it consists of a love triangle between the three criminals while they talk about planning this heist while knowing it's going to be pointless when the signal gets turned on. Seriously, two and a half hours long and most of it was just faffing around. Was this even edited at all? Did I just watch a rough cut? Because really, two and a half hours is proper movie length. That's Martin Scorsese stuff right there. How good did the people editing this movie think that it was? Basically, the movie's got a half-decent idea, but it's got no clue how to present it or what to do with it. The moral implications of a signal that controls people's brains are just sort of left to sit there. They're acknowledged occasionally, like we have some guy on a news show in the background talking about the signal giving people brain damage, but then it just moves on because it can't be asked to do any heavy lifting. And there are more of these news bits, pretty much all of the explorations of the actual idea are done via news broadcasts. It's as if the actual story is happening in the background. Like, is the government introducing this signal fascists? Because this is a government ostensibly using technology to create a police state here. There's a billion questions to ask. Ideally, you'd make this a political thriller, not a dumb action movie about a bunch of annoying scumbags robbing a bank or something. Like, even a basic attempt at social commentary wouldn't have been that hard, and it wouldn't have even demanded the movie drop all of its obnoxious dialogue or its big, dumb, stupid, confusing action sequences, or its frankly hilarious sex scenes which just have to be seen to be believed and almost, but not quite, make this whole thing worth it. Anyway, next up, if we're talking about shit Netflix movies, obviously we've got to talk about a regular feature in their lineup, the shit Adam Sandler comedy. Adam Sandler comedies, and it feels appropriate in this case that the word comedies has the word die contained within it, were a regular major draw at the box office for the first half of the 2010s. They made millions of dollars with very little visible effort. Basically, Adam Sandler and a rotating guest spot of a big name Hollywood actress would show up in tropical locations making funny faces, and that was pretty much it. In fact, he has been surprisingly open about the fact he sees filmmaking as essentially a paid vacation. And this surprises me, because that is possibly the most detestable attitude that anyone could possibly have towards the medium. Why would you admit to that in public? At least lie and say something like, oh yeah, I want to follow in the footsteps of Mel Brooks and The Ridiculous Six is going to be my blazing saddles. Sandler signed a deal with Netflix in 2015, and movies by his Happy Madison production company have been appearing on the service ever since. The latest one of these is called Murder Mystery, and this one's a bit different to his typical low-effort ventures, because apparently the script for it had been floating around Hollywood desperate to get made since about 2012, and you can tell that Sandler himself had very little input into the creative side of things, because someone was clearly trying to make an actual movie here. So Nick Spitz is a cop who never achieved his full potential, and he hasn't really been putting any effort into his marriage to Jennifer Aniston, but he finally breaks that cycle and is guilted into taking his wife, who's obsessed with mystery novels, on a tour of famous European cities, where they get invited on a fancy cruise full of rich people who all just happen to be stereotypical murder mystery characters, and people start being killed off one by one, and Nick and his wife end up becoming suspects. Upon hearing that, those of you who remember what Adam Sandler comedies used to be like about five years ago are probably thinking, wait, really? What's this? Characters? Motivation? Backstory? Efforts? Usually he'd just be an ad executive so they can justify product placement, and they'd just sort of be on a boat for no reason, and maybe there'd be a plot in there somewhere if whoever was writing the script for this one could be asked. At first glance, Murder Mystery seems like it's the exact opposite of everything you associate with Adam Sandler comedies, and yes, that would be a point in its favour, but in trying so desperately hard to be the exact opposite of a typical Adam Sandler comedy, it's just sort of… forgotten to be funny. Like, even trying to be funny. There's a couple of jokes I laughed at here and there, but Murder Mystery was so quiet and underplayed that I found I was more invested in it on the level of it being an actual murder mystery than a comedy, because the comedy basically amounts to Sandler and Aniston wander through an entirely straight-faced murder mystery story, offering a running commentary on how, ooh, isn't everything in this setting like it's out of a murder mystery novel? 
Look, there's a posh English guy and chandeliers and inheritance and a guy with a cane. And look at us, we're here in among all this. Isn't that weird? It's almost like we're fish out of water characters and that's the point. You'd basically get the same experience watching Murder Mystery to sitting and listening to a couple of people whispering to each other while watching a straight-faced adaptation of an Agatha Christie book. And as said, not even whispering jokes, just pointing at a thing and going, ooh, look, that's a thing. Given the script for this has been floating around Hollywood for almost a decade, as I watched it, I could imagine a scenario where it started life as a proper straight-faced murder mystery set on a boat in a tropical location with all these respectable names attached like Terence Stamp, but halfway through, someone realised that no one's going to watch that unless it's been hacked apart and Frankenstein together with a shit Adam Sandler comedy. And it appears that they were right. Millions and millions of people watched it. And that's just depressing, isn't it? Is this the only way to make a hit movie these days? Well, yes, your poignant life-affirming drama about a young woman who learns to trust herself and the world again after a traumatic incident sounds very nice and uplifting, but we'd rather make some actual money, so could you maybe rewrite it so it's about Adam Sandler doing some funny voices? And set it in a tropical location. He won't do it if it's not in a tropical location. Murder Mystery was a huge hit though, it was Netflix's most viewed movie in 2019, but views are a bit of a different conversation with Netflix because this isn't like box office numbers, because it turns out that a viewer only has to be watching a piece of Netflix content for two minutes for it to be counted as a view. That and unlike in cinemas where walking out on a movie will cause a scene, there's no social awkwardness involved in clicking on a title, getting bored and clicking away after two minutes. So one view does not mean that one person watched the whole thing. And I would really like to know just how many of the supposed 40 million people who watched the next movie we're going to be talking about, Secret Obsession, actually sat through the whole thing. Because by Christ, this movie is completely broken. To its credit, I can see how someone thought that Secret Obsession was a good idea. You know, if you'd squint really, really hard. Basically, a woman gets chased by a maniac and then hit by a car, and she wakes up in hospital with amnesia. She can't remember anything or anyone, and a guy shows up in the hospital claiming to be her husband, and he nurses her back to health. But that's not really her husband. He's secretly the maniac who was obsessed with her and engineered this whole scenario to wind up with the woman of his dreams. Secret Obsession sounds like a dumb, yes, but at the very least plausibly entertaining thriller about social paranoia. I can see how the writer who came up with this idea would have thought that it would make people look at their loved ones differently and think about whether someone that I apparently know better than anyone is hiding a dark and horrible secret. Trouble is, by using that as the premise to hook the viewer in, this causes the entire movie to fall to pieces, because the first 30 minutes treats the amnesiac woman getting nursed back to health and taken care of by her husband as an entirely straight-faced scenario, when the viewer knows what's coming. The twist is right there in the trailer. The twist is the point of the film. Jennifer had no ID. How did Russell prove he was her husband? If that's Russell, who's that? Like, there's no real suspense when I know what's going to happen, is there? And so any attempts at throwing the viewer off guard are hollow and meaningless. Like, one of the first red herrings it tries building up is this guy with a beard and a leather jacket. It even uses music cues to try and get the viewer to think that this is the actual bad guy. Mr. Khan, thanks for coming in. But we know it's not him. So what's the point of this character? The fake husband even kills him off and buries him in the back garden, which further underlines just how pointless this character is. And the fake husband keeps killing people throughout the movie to cover his tracks, the parents, the real husband. There's so many people he has to take care of he might come looking for her, but all this does is underline just how fragile his scheme is and how completely unbelievable the premise is. So what you're asking me to believe, right, is he shows up at the hospital claiming to be her husband. He then learns she has amnesia. He then goes off and engineers this entire scenario and makes this badly photoshopped family album, and he just has to hope that she doesn't notice all the screamingly obvious mistakes in it, and also that the hospital staff aren't going to stop and think at any point that releasing a woman with amnesia into the care of a man who she can't remember at all, who's just claiming to be her significant other, will probably cause her untold psychological distress. Like, I know the American healthcare system is shit, but this woman needs serious psychiatric care, right? 
the movie's just sort of decided that none of the real world logistics of its ludicrous premise matter. Like, okay, the amnesia that this guy can conveniently write himself into is stupid, yes, but I'll buy it for now. And I understand why she would accept this guy's bullshit, but everyone else in the movie? Have all of the hospital staff suffered serious head injuries as well? For any of this to work, not just the wife, every single character that appears on screen throughout the runtime would also need to be hit by cars right at the start of the film. And that's a lot of work, isn't it? Seriously, mate, it'd probably be simpler for you to just kidnap her and chain her in your basement like a proper maniac. In terms of efficiency, you're no Zodiac killer, are you, Ryan? D minus. Anyway, while we're on horror, Netflix do admittedly have a surprisingly good track record in this area. Like I mentioned earlier, the fact people can take chances with movies when there's less commitment involved with the click of a button, that means that weird, esoteric, high-concept character pieces that might not have done so well under different circumstances have a chance to succeed. You got stuff like Gerald's Game, which is every bit as good as everyone says it is and then some, and the hideously minimalist I Am The Pretty Thing That Lives In The House, which is such a strange film that would never have got made under any other circumstances. There's that, and then there's The Open House, a movie so hideously incompetent that it somehow managed to fuck up the simple There is spooky house, innocent family move in, go woo. Like, that is the simplest, most basic outline for a horror movie. How the hell do you fuck something like that up? The Open House even fucks up the basic jump scare by consistently having it so that the thing that jumps out at you set to a climactic chord turns out to be a fake out every single time it happens. Now the open house is starting in 15 minutes. Oh, Jesus! Did you, not, did you not hear us? Sorry, I was just locking everything up. It keeps doing this, but like the fifth one of these, I was totally desensitized to jump scares, which is the only trick this movie has up its sleeve. Okay, so the open house's foundations are admittedly quite solid. In fact, so solid that I was actually considering watching it unironically until I saw it only had a 14% on Rotten Tomatoes. So you got a lower middle class family, the dad dies suddenly in a car accident. The mum and son are then forced by circumstances to take up residency in an open house in the mountains until it gets sold. That house happens to be the centre of weird goings on which might be supernatural, might not be. You see, that works. You have family drama forcing them into a location against their wishes. The house is open to complete strangers, which is scary and weird. And the financial element means that they're trapped and can't leave even when things get scary. The problem is that the movie's full of such baffling creative decisions, or in this case indecisions, that it feels like it wasn't even made by humans. The open house is what you would get if you made an algorithm write a horror movie. It's full of horror movie odds and ends that have just sort of been cut and pasted together with no rhyme or reason or payoff. It's basically nothing but red herrings. It's like the writers couldn't decide whether it was meant to be a haunted house movie, a slasher movie, a psychotic townspeople movie, or a psychological none of it was real and the main characters going mad movie, and they only made up their minds that it was meant to be a slasher movie when they got to the final scene. But what that means is that we've got literal loose threads wandering about the runtime doing and meaning nothing. There's this crazy neighbour lady who shows up and says odd foreboding things occasionally. This leads to nothing. Like, it's not even a case of the movie being open to interpretation, it's just got this stuff in the runtime and couldn't decide whether that was the explanation until it got to the final scene. Basically, it turns out that the unseen killer is visiting the open house in the day and lurks in it at night to terrorise the mother and the son until one day, I'm guessing, he gets bored of playing with his victims and snaps and kills them. This wouldn't have been so bad on its own if they'd just decided that that was what the movie was about and done that. But admittedly, they probably would have fucked that up as well, because as said, there's so many strange creative decisions that made me think, no human with half a brain in their head would think this is effective, surely. Like, the shadowy figure that haunts them in the house at night first appears in a seemingly uncut sequence of the sun getting up to go for a piss in the middle of the night. Maybe it's an effect whereby the filmmakers think that you'll piss yourself in fear if you hear one of the main characters actually pissing. Anyway, lastly today, we're going to be looking at the Netflix original movie that depressingly there's a very strong chance that most people watching this video sat through. Yep, it's time to talk about Bird Box. 
Okay, I know some people are probably going to say I'm cheating here, because this video is about movies that are ruining Netflix's original movie line's credibility, and Bird Box is one of those rare cases where critics largely thought it was passable and audiences loved it. Bird Box was a huge hit, it's full of big Hollywood names, and it also inspired stupid people to invent one of those meme challenge things where they do dangerous things while blindfolded for some reason. What up guys? So today on the Stubank Full Channel, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing the Bird Box Challenge. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the hob on like this, I'm going to put my blindfold on like this, and I'm going to hold my hand directly on the hob until it burns my flesh off. Oh, be sure to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. Yes, Bird Box was a huge hit, so it is kind of unfair of me to lump it in with the explicitly Netflix original movie trash pile. It's my video though, it's about shit Netflix movies and I thought Bird Box was shit, so here we are. And warning, I'm going to mention suicide a lot during this bit because it's a core part of the movie. To be fair, I can see how people were tricked into thinking that Bird Box has merit because it's a bad movie with a good one buried inside of it. If the movie was just these sequences of Sandra Bullock taking her kids downriver to this safe house away from unseen monsters that are stalking them the entire time, that would have been a really solid edge of your seat horror thriller. Just imagine it, we're not given any context, we're just watching Sandra Bullock taking the kids to a safe house and hiding them from monsters that if they look at them, they'll die. And that's it, nothing else. It would make for a pretty decent episode of that middling Twilight Zone reboot that no one's been watching. But instead, this compelling story of survival horror has been cut up and stitched between scenes of annoying people shouting at each other in a house for far, far too long. Context is what kills Bird Box because it spends quite a lot of time trying desperately hard to explain to you why its threat is scary, and because it's an unseen nebulous threat it takes a very long time to do that. You're basically spending most of the movie watching a bunch of people standing around in a house arguing over what the point of the movie is. In a nutshell, monsters have shown up, and the gimmick is that when you look at these monsters it makes you immediately snap and try and kill yourself. And that causes everyone to panic and lock themselves in their houses and usher in the collapse of civilization. The monster thing is trying to play off the Lovecraft horror trope of this monster is so terrifying that it is beyond human comprehension and thus I can't even describe it to you. And that works well in prose because the human imagination can take that idea and make you cower in fear at something that you can't even begin to physically comprehend. All of this is why Bird Box was originally a book. This doesn't work so well on film because film is famously a visual medium. If it's a monster, then you need some kind of indication that something is actually physically there for you to be afraid of. But we don't get that. When people see the thing, they look all scared and then they kill themselves. This would be fine if it was some kind of airborne virus or some kind of random phenomenon where people just suddenly snap and kill themselves out of nowhere. Conceptually, that'd still be hideously tasteless, yes, but it would at least work. And you could follow the breakdown of society as people react to this wave of seemingly random mass suicides on a global scale. But because it's a monster, and the plot is that they're hiding from the monster in the house and making dangerous trips out to scavenge supplies, presumably we're meant to be scared of an actual physical thing that's out there. And given this physical thing has no presence at all, we're just watching a bunch of people jabbering about the thing that we're supposed to be scared of. It can't seem to decide whether we're supposed to be scared of the monster or what people do when they see the monster. It's trying to have its cake and eat it. You're either a psychological phenomenon or a simple there is monster, let us hide from that monster. Pick one movie. So we spend most of the movie having copious amounts of dialogue dumped in our laps that tries to explain what's happening here, both from our characters and the disaster movie's favourite exposition dumping resource, rolling news broadcasts. There is so much spoon-feeding dialogue in Bird Box that it becomes a parody of itself at times. It even has to tell you what its theme is. I actually kind of admire the balls of this scene near the start pre-apocalypse. So Sandra Bullock just happens to be a painter and she just happens to be working on a picture that essentially summarises what we're about to watch. What do you think? I see a whole bunch of people sitting together, but they all feel incredibly lonely. Well, the loneliness is just incidental. It's really about people's inability to connect. I was half expecting her to turn to the camera at that point and go, Do you get it? 
Even though Bird Box is about as basic as it comes and all the disaster monster movie tropes are in place, it's also hideously pretentious and thinks that it's much smarter than it is. It seems to think it's got something deep to say about mental health, because at about the midpoint we get the revelation that when mentally ill people see the monster, it's like they're possessed and they want to show the monster to unwilling victims. Which basically turns people with mental illnesses into the villains. Which as someone with mental health issues myself, thanks dickheads. But on the mental health thing for a second, a common reading of this movie is that by having these inexplicable invisible demons show up that make people kill themselves for no reason, the movie is basically a metaphor for people watching their loved ones succumb to mental illness. It's like they just suddenly snap and want to kill themselves for seemingly no reason at all, and the loved ones just don't understand why. But... Taking this reading as read, by making it so that people with mental health issues see the monster and they want to show it to everyone because they think it's so beautiful, what that's basically saying is that people with mental health issues love their mental health issues and that's why they're dangerous and they will try and drag their loved ones down with them. Just... Okay, word of advice, if you want to make a shitty monster movie and then someone has the bright idea to involve mental illness and suicide as core parts of the premise and you do not have the necessary skills to deal with this subject at all, please feel free to give that person a slap and tell them to stop being such a twat. If you don't know what you're doing with this subject, don't do it. Just keep it simple, alright? Just have your monster be, like, like a really big duck. Yeah, yeah, a really big duck. That I would watch. Sandra Bullock rows her kids downstream away from a really big duck. Edge your seat thrill ride. Five stars. Oh my god, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is what? What? What are you looking at? Did you see what? What are you looking at?